2011, a journalist, Glenn Milne, expanded on an old article of his from 2007 online. It told of Julie Gillard's four-year affair with a married con man who was the central figure in a massive union fraud in the 90s. Miss Gillard claimed she knew nothing about the dodgy goings-on of her boyfriend and she famously claimed in her defence that she was young and naive. But Milne conjectured that Gillard's actions in the past could leave her vulnerable to improper pressure from some officials who knew the full extent of the fraud. Around the same time, interest was being shown by a few other journalists. After all, Gillard was the Prime Minister and not many people knew about the significant story from her past. But word was spreading that there was a lot more to this story than had ever been revealed before. But Michael Smith from 2UE had a scoop. Bob Kernhan was a former president of the Victorian branch of the AWU. He was personally involved in a failed attempt to publicly investigate and expose the fraud. And now Mr. Kernahan spoke to Michael Smith at length. This story was dynamite. It told of a conspiracy of cover-ups and the involvement of several senior ALP ministers. Some reports even said that Gillard had personally benefited from the fraud and the details of this were even discussed in Victorian Parliament. Kernahan had been met with strong opposition and he had even been severely beaten up in an attempt to silence him. The union did not want the details of the affair to surface. They still don't. Michael Smith emailed the Prime Minister's office and asked some relevant questions, but they continually refused to answer, so clearly he had hit a nerve. So Smith recorded an extended interview with Mr Kernahan. His story was backed up by the considerable number of documents he'd kept. Smith announced that he would go to air soon with the whole interview and listeners waited eagerly to hear the story. But they never got to hear that recording. Behind the scenes, the Prime Minister had personally threatened media bosses over publication of the story. They later reported that Gillard went nuclear and ballistic with rage. Basically, she had censored all publication. It's important to understand that at this time the Labour Green government were talking up a media inquiry and newspaper chiefs, especially from News Limited, were understandably uneasy about the potential control of the press that the ALP were considering. But Gillard's personal interference with the press is totally unacceptable to anyone who believes that freedom of the press is a vital part of democracy and it certainly made Miss Gillard look like she had something to hide. But she got away and the stories were pulled. But Glenn Milne, a seasoned political reporter, lost his job at the ABC and Michael Smith lost his job with 2UE. Both were victims of the cover-up machine. The Prime Minister, it appeared, would stop at nothing to suppress the story of her involvement with one of the biggest frauds and union corruption Australia has ever seen. So. What happened in the early 90s that Gillard was so anxious to hide? The story started in 1991 when Bruce Wilson, a flashy union boss from WA, started a relationship with an ambitious industrial lawyer. Julia Gillard was in her early 30s and was a salaried partner in the large successful firm of lawyers Slater and Gordon. The AWU was a very large client of Slater and Gordon and Miss Gillard was the trusted industrial lawyer who looked after their legal affairs. At this time, Wilson was actually married man with children, but his family lived in Perth, so it was easy for him to conduct a fairly open relationship with Gillard whilst in Melbourne. The frauds actually took place in Victoria and in Western Australia. They involved large sums of money being deposited, not in official AWU bank accounts, but in bank accounts with similar names, intentionally created to sound like the real thing. The only difference was that these dodgy bank accounts were meant for Wilson's personal use. Wilson was able to wine and dine Miss Gillard and live a very good life on the proceeds of these illicit accounts for several years. The fraud in WA centred around the bank account of a certain entity called 
the Australian Workers' Union Welfare Reform Association, one of Wilson's fake accounts. But Wilson had needed official documents to enable him to open the new bank account with. And to make this happen, he was therefore trying to create an association with the ambiguous name of AWU Welfare Reform Association. But he ran into trouble. Unions weren't supposed to become associations. So he flew to Melbourne with Ralph Blewett to get help from his girlfriend. Wilson and Blewett had a long meeting with Julia Gillard and Bernard Murphy. They prepared all the necessary documentation for Blewett to relodge the application in Perth on their return. Significantly, the application was later queried, but Gillard personally assured the Corporate Affairs Commissioner that the association was legitimate. Now, Gillard may have actually breached West Australian Corporations law, because the application documents filled out by her stated its purpose was development of changes to work to achieve safe workplaces. But Gillard later admitted to her bosses that she actually knew that the real purpose of the association was to serve as an election slush fund. So did she lie on the application form? And so the bank account was soon opened and hundreds of thousands of dollars passed through it. Money came mainly from large construction companies who said they thought that they were paying the real AWU for training. One of the main sources of money was from Tease contractors and coincidentally it turns out that the boss of Tease, Joe Trio, who approved these payments was actually Bruce Wilson's brother-in-law. But that's another story. Wilson was transferred to Victoria and wanted a place to live in. So he and Gillard attended a property auction together in Melbourne and signed a contract of sale for a house in Kerr Street, Fitzroy for $230,000. They paid an on-the-spot deposit of 10%. and It looks like this deposit was paid for from the fraudulent WA bank account. The property was actually purchased using a power of attorney in the name of Ralph Blewett, with Wilson having the power of attorney. Once more, we see the hand of Miss Gillard, who personally prepared the document and who duly witnessed it. But Ralph Blewett now claims that he did not sign the document in Miss Gillard's presence. And there is also some doubt as to the real date of the power of attorney and if in fact it was backdated. If these allegations are true, there are very serious consequences for Miss Gillard. Later, $67,000 was taken from the false bank account and used to pay for the balance of a settlement. Did bells ring at Slater and Gordon? Should they have queried this? Slater and Gordon also organised a home loan for the purchase of the property, but later Gillard denied that she knew anything about this. It does seem to stretch credibility that after going to the auction with Wilson, preparing the power of attorney for him, she didn't know that it was her own company who was funding the mortgage. But Slater and Gordon lawyer Nick Stein Brown, who worked with Julie Gillard, came forward to say he has a document that proves Miss Gillard knew about the home loan. He claims there's no doubt that Miss Gillard knew of the Slater and Gordon mortgage in March 93. So Wilson lived in the Kerr Street house for the next couple of years and his girlfriend Julia was a regular visitor. But eventually things went wrong for Wilson in Melbourne and his fraudulent dealings there in Victoria were finally discovered. An investigation was launched by some very concerned people in the AWU. There was a great deal of money involved and some in the union, including Bob Kernahan, wanted a full inquiry. There were even calls for a Royal Commission. But more powerful forces decided that they couldn't afford the scandal and so they tried to hush up the affair. Amazingly, they had Slater and Gordon negotiate a redundancy package for Wilson and Blewett, who were given very generous payouts. And so they walked away, never to be held accountable, and no money was ever retrieved. Gillard's troubles started when builders turned up at the AWU offices. They wanted payment for work they had done on renovating Gillard's home. 
This story spread to the offices of Slater and Gordon, leading them to hold a secret internal investigation into her conduct. As part of this investigation, Gillard was questioned in a lengthy tape-recorded interview conducted by two senior partners. They had found files hidden in her office and were unhappy to find that Gillard hadn't opened formal legal files for the work she conducted for Wilson and she had also not charged for her services. Notably, when Slater and Gordon asked Gillard about the renovation work on her house, she said she paid for the work, but she couldn't categorically rule out the fact that some work might have been paid for by Wilson. She claimed that her relationship with Wilson was now over. But clearly, at the very least, there had been a conflict of interest. The firm's partners made a decision that Gillard must leave the firm. She was allowed to resign, left the firm, and she never practiced law again. But significantly, Gillard failed to inform the AWU or the police about the association in Perth and the house she often shared with Wilson. In fact, it was over six months before the AWU finally found out about the massive fraud in Perth and the house in Fitzroy. This six-month silence enabled Wilson to sell the Kerr Street property and any possibility of recouping some of the money was lost. The story finally died. Gillard was unemployed for around six months and she finally got into Parliament as the member for Laylock in 1998. Slater and Gordon lost the prestigious AWU account to their rival law firm, Morris Blackburn, when Nicola Roxon, the current Attorney General, took over the files, Bernard Murphy also went to Morris Blackburn. But in 2012, significant witnesses came forward and some major work was done to bring the story back into the current limelight. Certain broadcasters, bloggers, lawyers and journalists were determined to continue the fight to reveal the true story despite many media outlets initially claiming there was no story. But with the help of contemporaneous documents and witnesses, and even Ralph Blewett, who wants to come clean with the whole story, slowly the full picture is emerging. And then the federal opposition took up the call in Parliament to try to get some answers from Ms Gillard. Continually, day after day, she would not answer the questions asked and tried to divert attention by personally attacking a number of people who were actively trying to get to the truth. Julie Bishop asked Ms Gillard why she did not report the fraud to police. Gillard looks smug and is protected by her ministers, so we still don't know the answer to that important question and many others. But now the Victoria Police have launched an official investigation. Julia Gillard, amongst others, is now a person of interest and at some stage will have to answer to the police. There are a lot of people involved in this story. The AWU are not happy. As one of them said in a memo, we're all history if this gets out. That evidence is slowly being uncovered. Some people will not be pleased about what is to come. Sing song of the trade union movement is solidarity forever. And I'm going to sing the verses and you are going to bellow out the chorus. So here we go. When the union's inspiration through the workers' blood shall run, there can be no power greater. 